Okay, 235, let's do it. All right, so I wanted to spend one more lecture digging into some of the nuances about sort of the value iteration pipeline, and in particular, to extend that, it sounds a little loud, um, understand what it looks like if we were to, for instance, use a neural network as our function approximator for, uh, for a value iteration pipeline. I think that can work extremely well right now, but I want to make sure we use the things we already know, for instance, some of the analytical solutions, to sort of inspect carefully what's happening in the more complicated systems, because otherwise, um, I think it's easy to, to not fully understand the implications of certain decisions. Uh, so I think it'll be a good chance for us to dig in a little bit farther and understand things deeply. Okay, so <clears throat> last time we talked about, you know, the LQR for balancing I actually showed quickly at the end for, you know, the, we did the pendulum, cart pole, acrobats, cart um, quad rotors in 2D and 3D. I actually could have gone on a few more. I had like a ball bot ready, which a segue kind of thing ready, you know, that you could just, you can just apply that pretty reliably to systems. And, um, there were a few key ideas there, right? So, one was this thinking a bit deeply about what it means to do a local linearization of a nonlinear system, right? And I tried to make that point that, you know, even though the pendulum had this dynamics that is nonlinear and you know, complicated that the linearization, this is Q versus Q dot for the pendulum, right? We looked at linearizing around the upright configuration and we got a linearization that, despite my artwork, was actually a very beautiful approximation of the true system for some, some swath of states just from doing the linearization. And then if that linearization is good for big parts of state space, then that means linear optimal control is pretty powerful. For pretty big parts of the state space, right? LQR is the one we focused on. There's lots of, you'll see different variants of linear optimal control later when we start talking about robustness and and things like this, okay? Um, and if I didn't say it clearly enough, you know, LQR obviously, because it works for all these systems, uh, we know how to solve the linear optimal control problem even for under-actuated systems. Like once it's a linear state-space model, it doesn't really matter if B is under-actuated, low rank or not, that we just know how to solve that, right? If it's not stabilizable, then LQR correctly says can't do it. But under-actuated is no problem. It's not even a notable distinction in that world. And the other point that I kind of wanted to make and wanted to land, and so I will remind you here, um, <clears throat> I actually used basically the same cost function for all of those examples, right? My Q function, my Q matrix was basically 10, 10, 1, 1, you know, whatever the appropriate size for all, all of those examples, and my R matrix was basically always one. Okay, and, and like it, there was no cost function tuning involved. Like you, if I really wanted to eke out performance or something, sure, I could tune a little bit, but it's not required. You put a, a stabilizable A and B matrix in, positive Q, you know, positive uh, semi-definite Q, positive definite R, and it will just give you an, a stabilizing controller. So that's pretty awesome. And for balancing, that was sort of a sufficient good solution. But it didn't address the whole problem. We want to swing up and balance, right? And we'll see some model-based versions of, sorry, let, let me say it differently. Let me see some 
nonlinear control. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll hand design some controllers that will swing up and balance some of these systems when we start talking about Lyapunov functions. But I already put out value iteration out there, so why, you know, can we make value iteration solve these problems? And absolutely we can, but it takes a little bit more work than what we've done so, so far um, up till today. So today I want to talk about approximate dynamic programming. And basically, um, I showed you that value iteration on a mesh Showed you that for the pendulum, right? Let's say for pendulum swing up. And one could make that work for the acrobat or the cart pole. Quadrotor would be pushing it, okay? But the mesh would have to be very big. Like it's just not super satisfying. So let me remind you actually, I can even run it. Here. Oops, forgot to answer the question. See if that works. All right. All right, remember a very simple, efficient, spends all its time right, making the animation basically. Comes up with this beautiful, that's actually. Um, it's actually twisted a little bit. No, no, it's not. Okay, and we can swing up and uh, balance the cart pole, yeah? Or the, the pendulum. Okay, so that works beautifully for the pendulum, but let's just remember in the code, if we looked at it, I made a mesh where I said my Q bins, my bins for Q, were, um, you know, I had 51 bins. Let me write it this way. 51 bins. And I had 51 bins for Q dot. And I had nine bins for U. Does that make sense? So I made a 51 by 51 by nine mesh. By the way, why, did I, why is it 51? Why not 50? I want to make sure zero's in there, right? If I do like NP lin space, you know, negative two, two, five, or you know, four, then I miss zero. What does that give me? That gives me something like negative two, negative two thirds, two thirds, two. All right, but if I pick an odd number here, then I'll actually get the zero that I wanted so much. Okay, so I almost always have like 31, 51, something like this, just to make sure that zero, zero, zero is in the middle of that mesh. Okay, always odd numbers there. All right, so that's kind of big, you know. I mean, that's that's reasonable. It didn't. It made a decent sort of mesh here. Captured some of the details of the of the pendulum. If I start scaling that, you know, let's say the acrobat is now four dimensional, then what that's 51 times nine, something like this, I start, I start getting to that. If that was sufficient, I would actually be fine with that. That's, you know, CPUs are a thing now, you know, we can make big um, neural networks are much smaller than that, right? But, um, but actually that level of resolution isn't enough to balance the acrobat nicely. And then you start dialing up those numbers, and then it just starts feeling like you're just not solving it quite, quite right. Okay. So I want to address that um, a little bit more today. Right. Now the interpolation that I did there, right? I, even though I say I did it on a mesh, when we make the mesh approximation of the dynamics, there's still a little bit going on there, which I've always alluded to but never quite described. Right. So if I simulate with one of my u's from some particular q versus q dot, I'm not going to land exactly at the other one. So I actually have to interpolate between these. And the type of interpolation that I used there was called barycentric interpolation. And 
I mentioned that again here because we're going to, you know, you'll understand a little better why I picked that particular form of interpolation uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so the natural question is, can we get away from this mesh representation and use more modern, you know, scalable architecture? Let's put a neural network in there, right? So what is it gonna look like if we do, um, so I'm gonna say that my estimate for J at some function, at some state x, is going to be a neural network parameterized by um, some vector alpha. A lot of people would use theta for their neural network parameters, but we've got a lot of thetas flying around, so I'll use alpha. Okay? So these are like the weights and biases of my network. I'll Squished up, put into one vector, just so I can think about it as a as a parameter. <clears throat> and so, the, one of the big questions is, what is my value iteration update now? Okay, so. Recall the very fully discrete case, the tabular case, if you will. Everything was discrete. I wrote that as j hat at a discrete state si. I'm going to update this for all si in my discrete states s. I did an update which was the minimum over A, which is a discrete set of checks with discrete actions. Right, so computationally, if this is a finite list of numbers, because there's only a finite number of states I want to represent, then I can just represent j as a vector of numbers before. Right? I can, if this is for, of course, s n plus 1 is f of s n, a n, and my total loss being the sum So if I represent j hat as a vector of numbers, then I can, by evaluating my dynamics for one step for all possible a's, I can figure out for each of those what my new s is. I look into my vector of numbers. I can compute this right-hand side for any particular s and a. Right? I'll do it for all the s's and all the a's. I'll take the smallest a. Right? That's just a, now a number. And I'll update that element, the ith element of the vector, with that number. Okay, so that was a that was the simple version of the algorithm. That's what we do in graph search. What is the extension of that to neural nets, right? Okay, so the the analogy is that we're going to basically take a bunch of sample points, right? So let's take you know, SI was given as there's only a fixed number of S's ever in the world. Now we have a continuous X. We can't easily evaluate for all X, but we can sample densely in X, okay? So let's draw samples. We'll call it XI. We'll draw it, let's say, from, from some total alphabet of samples that I'll call the state samples, x samples, which is going to be some, you know, some, they're all from my state space x. 
And I'll draw some U samples also. Maybe I'll use the same notation. Okay. And then for each of those samples, for all I, J, I can, I can produce what is like my next X, X, I'll call it X prime, given I took I, started at state I and took action J by just evaluating the dynamics. So now I have a bunch of state samples, a bunch of input samples, and then my next state sample, if you will, right? Similarly, I can compute my loss at all of the sample points. And I'm going to say, I'll go one more step. I'm going to say that my desired J, when I'm in state I, or sample point I, is going to be the min over J. Of, over those things. This is like just a sampled version of what I wrote above. Does that kind of make sense? So I'm just in the sampling world. At every sample, I can take one step, evaluate my costs to go, and say I now have a new desired value for that sample point. This exists, like, this is a quantity that's, there's one for every one of my state samples. Yeah? I don't love this notation, but what I'm saying is this is like the real numbers, in this case for a pendulum, it would be the real numbers that represent Q and Q dot, right? So that, that lives in R and R2 in this case. This is my continuous space, and I'm sampling a, a finite set of points from that. And then xi is one element of that sampled set. Thank you. Yeah? Um, so this is still in the, the, my dynamics are discrete time. Yeah, so this is discrete time dynamics. If you were given continuous time dynamics, then you would make an approximation to get that. Yep. And this is also a discrete time cost. We can make it fully continuous soon. In fact, we will. Yes? Um, that's a good point. Okay, so there are cases where you don't have a minimal coordinate system, let's say, where not all, you know, where not all samples from the naive configuration space would represent real things. If you have like a four bar linkage is a classic example of that, then somehow the sampling problem might be more naive, more delicate, let's say. Um, you could say you might want a rejection sample collisions or something like this. There could there be other reasons. So I, I admit that that's, that's true, but I think for now we can kind of just say, uh, assume, you know, uh, provide infinite cost for things that are in collision and don't try to apply this yet to systems that have constraints. We'll have better solutions for the constraint system. This one, it doesn't fit as naturally into this. Equality constraints are kind of a different object than, than collisions or inequality constraints. Sampling and equality constraints don't play so well together if that makes sense, unless you can sample from the manifold. Is that notation sort of okay? So imagine, you know, I've got my, for instance, my pendulum dynamics here. By the way, can I just observe that I think this, by trying the different, either they fixed it, okay, now I don't know. <laughs> they could have fixed it last, since in the last week, but I'm gonna say that this fixed it. 
and we're going to keep work, we're going to work with that as our hypothesis, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so so you know, um, I have this picture up here. I've got an approximate j over the space. I'm, how am I going to evaluate it? I'm going to pick a bunch of sample points in this. I'm going to simulate the forward dynamic the dynamics forward for one step to compute what j next would be. I'll do that for all my possible actions. Take the minimum over that, right? And I come up with a new desired value for that for any one point. That's all I'm doing here. So I'm using my current estimate to come up with a new desired value at that particular estimate. And then the next step is just supervised learning. This is what neural networks do well. I'm going to try to make the output of the network look more like the desired value at all the sample points. Okay? And then I'll minimize the loss, which would be the sum over all those sample points of my output of my estimate, let's say, minus the desired sample. We'll call it squared, so it's a least squared problem, nonlinearly squared problem. I'll minimize that over alpha. Okay, and when this is a big neural network, probably we're going to do that with gradient descent or atom or you know mini batch, all the tricks that people know for for gradient descent, yeah? This is one of the biggest questions, so let me just repeat it. So, um, yeah, why should this converge? Okay, I, okay, in the arbitrary nonlinear systems, arbitrary neural network, I can't tell you it will converge. People empirically have had pretty good success. Um, but there are special cases where I can tell you it will converge, and we'll look at them in a minute. But let me just, before I, you know, to, to, to play off that contrastive comment, I wrote this in two steps, and I mean this in two steps. I have actually separated out, so I'm going to, um, take my current estimate j hat, use that to create a new set of desired values. Then given those fixed desired values, I'm going to stick that in and try to solve a supervised learning problem. That is slightly different than if I were to just put all this into here. Because alpha, I want to separate the, the minimization here. I only want to optimize this alpha. I don't want to optimize this alpha and this alpha at the same time. That's where it sh seems like it could work. It's a contrastive thing, but it has some dege degenerate solutions and things like this, okay? So people will typically separate out the next cost to go prediction from the optimization. There's a couple ways people do this. There's another way you could do that was you, would, you could use a target network. People heard the term target network in reinforcement learning. Sometimes you'll see this as written as, I'll minimize the loss sum over i. Um, j hat alpha xi minus the min over j li j plus let's say j hat beta xi j squared something like this. Okay, you could say I'll keep two copies of my neural network parameters around alpha and beta. Again, the goal is just to separate those out, and I, I'll change beta more slowly. Beta typically becomes like a low-pass filter on alpha. So this is like the target network that people use in reinforcement learning. But for training stability, and there's theorems that back this up, but it's certainly in practice that backs this up, you typically want to separate out. You don't want your uh, desired values to change at the same rate as your learning. You want to have a two time scale algorithm. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really good. So, um, well, it's certainly it's more flexible. So, the question was how is sampling different? So, I could potentially just use my uniform mesh samples, and we will actually to begin with. Um, and that's a pretty, that's, that's a reasonable way to go. But when you get to the really high dimensional things, uh, you know, the requirement of sampling uniformly in all dimensions and making a big grid is too much. So you need to relax that and somehow have a more you know, uh, haphazard ab the ability to sample anywhere and they don't have to be 
like regular or going near to each other and stuff like that. And in particular, the bigger to go to really higher dimensional spaces, we're going to end up we're going to think about doing on policy sampling. Okay, so today we're talking about kind of I can solve the whole problem, so I can sample a lot around state space. But if you're a humanoid, there's no chance of sampling all possible states. Right? I, I like to joke that I'm, you know, I've got lots of degrees of freedom. I don't have enough time in my life to visit all of my states. Right? There's just like a lot of them that I will never visit, partly because I'm inflexible, but but also because I don't have time and there's it's a big space. Yeah, so you need to like focus your samples on the relevant parts, and that's something that reinforcement learning does well. It, it's like a version of this where you take your best estimate and you only explore the parts of state space that your policy actually reaches and that it guides your sampling to a much, much, much smaller subset of states. So you're right to call me on it. This is kind of a halfway point where I'm just relaxing that assumption, but it's the one that goes more of the distance. Okay, so that's kind of, kind of good. If we, uh, if we if we separate this out, we can imagine sort of doing supervised learning, and supervised learning works incredibly well for big, complicated networks. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah. So what? Let's actually dig into that. When does it actually work? When can I tell you it works? When does it converge? Is it known to converge? And there's a really important special case. which if you've watched any of the sort of theory of neural networks, you won't be surprised. This predates a lot of the, the most recent theory, but the stories are the same. Basically, it works for linear neural networks, okay? Once you go into like complicated nonlinear networks, you know, the theory doesn't totally keep up, but for linear neural networks, we can understand everything, okay? Let me use this, the following notation to denote um, a linear neural network. Okay, so I'll, I'll write this as just basically the last layer. So I've got some input features. I can, these can be nonlinear, right? Sometimes, you know, in the old days, this was like a radial basis function network. You know, nowadays it's like a randomly initialized neural network with frozen weights, okay? But it, the story is the same. You have some complicated, potentially, or, arbi you know, arbitrary function from state into some features, but it's a fixed function. And the only thing I'm going to do is basically train that output layer, which is a linear mapping from those to the, to the estimate of the cost. Okay. In that case, we know a lot, right? I could, you know, if it's helpful, I could write this as the sum over j since I had i before. Just a linear combination of a lot of nonlinear basis elements, right? Um, you know, and, and this is a, a common thing to study, like I say, in neural network theory. So a lot of the results about why does deep learning work are in this case where you're thinking about um, ultra-wide neural networks where basically, you, no matter how complicated the neural network is, you can just think of the first n minus one layers as giving you some sufficiently rich feature space. And all of the work that has to happen happens in this last layer, which is an easy problem. And if that problem works, then deep learning works. I think that's, the, that's the kind of the neural tangent kernel idea. It's not, I would say it's not fully I think everybody knows there's limits to that analogy, but that's kind of where some of the theory of deep learning started making progress. Okay, so why does this help? Why is it more amenable to our analysis here? So it turns out in the case where um, we're doing now value iteration and we have a linear function approximator, a linear neural network, then the thing that gets better, and it's the same thing in neural network analysis, but that last step, that supervised learning step, where I'm going to minimize that loss, I have guarantees that, that gradient descent will find a, a local minima, 
I could even just do regular linear least squares to find the solution to that. Right? So in this setting, the minimize over alpha, the loss, sum over i, alpha transpose d xi minus j desired, i squared is a linear least squares. It has a closed form solution. And also, um, you know, stochastic gradient descent, SGD, is guaranteed to do the right thing. Right, so you can sort of, if I, if this setup helps, we kind of said it a little bit, right? If I think of value iteration as kind of two things, two steps, one is coming up with the desired next value and the second is like the supervised learning step. This lets us effectively just say this, is a, this second step is a non-issue. It's gonna, I know whatever I do there, it's gonna solve the global optimality. And then all the interesting stuff is at the first step and I get to think hard about the convergence properties of that. And fortunately, very smart people have thought hard about the convergence properties of that and shown that in, with some assumptions, uh, it converges, okay, for linear function approximation. So the famous result is by John Sosiklis, actually. Some of you might have taken probability from him. Um, and Van Roy in 97 showed that linear function approximator, the value iteration, and even temporal difference learning, okay, Something called TD lambda, what we'll talk about later, the temporal difference learning RL algorithm with linear function approximators, linear neural networks, converges. In particular, it converges to the best alpha, so that the so it it comes as close as possible to, to being uh, to the optimal J star. Yep, and so I should be, um, you know, please read the paper. Every, anytime I say there's a proof, please read the paper and understand all the assumptions. But um, so the, the setting that was most carefully studied there uh, was in actually where the state space is actually discrete. It's potentially infinite, but it's discrete, okay? And then a function approximator in a discrete space means I could summarize, let's say, a million states with like a smaller set of basis functions, like 100 states. Okay, so the function approximator story still works, but there are a few things that you get out of being drawing from a d discrete state that makes that proof go through. People have done more recent work to extend that formally to the continuous space, but there's more assumptions and more requirements. Okay, but as a mental model, if you're willing to choose, restrict yourselves to linear neural networks, then we have some guarantees in practice it, you know, things should, should converge. Okay. Why did I pick barycentric interpolation? Guess what? Barycentric interpolation is, has an, is a linear function approximation. There's various ways you can interpolate an, a mesh. Um, barycentric is in particular nice compared to some of the other mesh interpolation. It scales well to higher dimensions. You, you can choose n plus one interpolants, okay? But your, your estimate here is a linear combination of the neighboring interpolants in barycentric interpolation, okay? So even though I talked about the mesh being a completely separate case, the analysis for why the mesh-based approximation goes through is actually going through the linear function approximator language. Questions of that? Yeah. T 
CD lambda is a different algorithm that I haven't talked about yet. This is more of the on policy. It's called temporal difference learning. Lambda is the um, is this decay, is the eligibility thing. So I either have to tell you that completely or not tell you. Sorry, I shouldn't have even written it, I guess. But well, I'll tell you it completely later, I promise. Yeah. Um, I think of batching differently. Like even if I were to if I were to just solve this for a bunch of um, I's and J's, I could use mini batch or something to, to you know hammer on this and do SGD to go down that landscape. Um, the question is when do you go back and reevaluate these? Right? If you uh, yeah, as long as you separate out the computation of the desireds from the actual gradient update. If you want to think about that as batching. Then that's fine, yeah. But somehow there's a there's a loop here, <laughs> which is compute these based on your previous estimate, and then do some updates. Typically, people will take many steps of gradient descent here, not just one, you know, and then uh, before they go back to reevaluate that. Okay. Um, again, in the spirit of understanding. Using the fact that we understand some closed form solutions to like sort of study this, let's let's look at LQR through the lens of this sort of function approximator architecture. Can I say anything about you know the algorithm that I just wrote there if I were to apply it to an LQR problem? Okay. If it doesn't work for LQR, something that I have a closed form solution for, maybe it's not going to go the distance. Okay? And it turns out. There are ways to write it down that people do all the time, which don't work for LQR, right? So there's some subtlety here. If it was just like an obvious it's going to go through, I wouldn't do. I wouldn't spend the time. But there's actually some subtlety here. Um, okay, so um, how does that work? For LQR. In particular, since, since just since I wrote everything down discrete and it's a little conceptually easier, I'm going to do the discrete time version of LQR, which isn't the one I derived, but is an adjacent, very similar def, uh, derivation. Still has a closed form solution. You can still call the LQR method with a discrete time system, get a different K and S out. Okay, very similar, similar Riccati equation. And in particular, even in discrete time LQR, we know that J star of x takes this form of x transpose s of x. It's a quadratic form. So that's a quadratic function, right? But today, it's a linear neural network, right? The parameters of the neural network are s, and the, they enter the equation linearly. Even though it's quadratic in x, it's linear in the parameters, and that's what matters. If it helps you to see that, um, this is a scalar, so I can take the trace of a scalar, right? And that's the trace of a scalar is the same thing. And then I can flip things around with the trace. So it's kind of like the basis functions are like my outer product of x is kind of the way to think about that. So the this is, the trace takes the diagonal, some of the diagonals of this, but you know the, the nonlinear basis functions are something like x squared, outer product of x. If you know trace and think about matrices a lot, that might help. But it's fine to just say s, s enters here linearly. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's take exactly the code that I've written here for value iteration, and I'm, I'm not going to use it. I'm, I'm not going to use like a PyTorch model, I'm actually going to do this algorithm on this thing, okay? And I can just do gradient descent on s. I can change the parameters of s. I can take the gradient of that loss function with respect to s, and I can do gradient descent on s. Okay, and let's see what happens. Okay, I did it in the wrong order, but here we go. So this is too small for you to see, but I'm going to make it bigger. 
So this is my epochs going up of my iterations, okay? And uh, my loss function is getting very big, okay? And my S estimate is getting very wrong because I know that the optimal S should be this. I just chose like the double integrator dynamics. I just picked some very simple dynamics, very simple A, B, and Q and R, okay? The optimal S should be like around one. And I started running this algorithm and I started getting S's that were, let me just, now that you see what I was, was plotting, you can see that these numbers are just kind of going unstable up and away. So if you just apply this algorithm, as I've said it, to the double integrator, it doesn't work, okay? And this is actually the algorithm that, this is almost the algorithm that most people would use, okay? So that requires maybe a little bit of investigation. So why does that not work? Um, is it clear what I said about this? So the, the, the update I did, I just said that the loss here, the sum over i of my sample points, and I just have this x transpose my current s, i minus this j desired, i squared, and I just took the gradient of this. I said s hat is going to be s hat minus some, I did gradient descent, my loss partial s hat. Okay, I was just doing gradient descent on that. and it went unstable, okay? You could say, oh, dude, you probably picked a bad eta, but I didn't, I promise. Tried, tried pretty hard, I don't think that's it, okay? If I picked my learning rate badly, that could certainly make it go unstable. I could have a math error, but I don't think I do, because I can show you, I can prove and fix it, okay? Um, just to be clear, right, so the, lo the loss is a scalar, the gradient with respect to a, of a Scalar with respect to a matrix is still a matrix, so that, that looks a little funny to my eyes, but that's still a well-defined matrix operation. Data, okay. So what's wrong? What is what did not work about that algorithm applied to LQR? How would you fix it? I did it in the two steps. Yeah. Well, that could have made it unstable. You're right. That is the kind of thing you see if you don't separate the scales. Thanks, Will. LQR is trying to solve an infinite horizon optimal control problem. Remember we said every time you're writing an infinite horizon optimal control problem, you got to be a little careful that the cost doesn't run to infinity. How does LQR avoid running to infinity? Yeah. Discount factor is going to be one solution. That's, that's, a, that's a good solution. But the standard LQR doesn't, the math doesn't go to infinity because normally you can get exactly to zero. Right? You need your x and u to get exactly to zero. So you can try harder than I tried, but the, the natural choices of x and u are not going to give you state value pairs that get you exactly to zero. Right? Therefore, if your cost can't get to zero, you will continue to accumulate cost, and your value iteration estimate will just go up and up and up and up. I actually chose, I parameterized it with a quadratic form. So the estimate, at when I put zero in, I'm always going to get zero out. But the slope is wrong, and it gets more and more and more wrong in an unstable way. Yeah? So how would you do that? So the fixed point is in there. So it, I, I, I was careful to put 0x zero, zero, zero and 0u, zero which is the fixed point, as one of the samples. 
And I was careful to parameterize it so the j was 0 at that, no matter what my parameters are. But that wasn't enough. But I think your proposal is right. And I, I we, there is a way to do that. Okay, so I've heard two proposals. I've heard discounting, and I've heard be smarter with your samples. Okay, let's look quickly at both. They both can solve it. This, I, I actually think that the discounting is the one that I think most people in RL would would use because it's a very general mechanism, right? So a, a very standard thing would be discounted costs. Okay, so instead, right now I've got n equals zero to infinity. My loss of x n u n and an infinite sum over things that don't go to don't go <laughs> to zero is going to be bad news. Okay, so. A standard modification to this would be to put a discount factor in there so that things decay exponentially, where gamma is chosen to be between 0 and 1, so some sort of stable decay. And this is also has a, a simple recursive form. It goes directly into the, the value iteration equation. You just get a loss plus gamma j. But that's not the essential thing, right? So, so this can this can fix it, and it maybe my uh, skills of deception are not very good since there's a gamma 0.9 uncommented uncom right there. Um, okay, that just solves it. If I change gamma to 0.9, even 0.99, that just solves it. So now my loss is going down beautifully, and S converges to close to, if I let it go a little longer, it would converge even closer to the right value, okay? By the way, you can also, um, there's a closed form solution for LQR in the discounted case too that I'm comparing against, because it does change the optimal answer, right? The, the K and S matrices that you would get out are different if you're solving the discounted problem. So my, I had to update my analytical answer as well as my, um, my numerical one. Um, so that is one solution that works. Yeah. Just, I think it unstably goes to infinity. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It might, it might be like, S star uh, times some number that goes to infinity, yeah. times the scalar goes to It could be, it could be. That would be totally plausible to me. It's, uh, yeah, I would actually maybe expect that, but I don't know that. I, I didn't check that, yeah. I would say I was moderately careful. So to be clear, I, I chose the zero to be one of the mesh points, but I did not go to all the other mesh points and figure out a U that would have taken me to zero. That would be the next level of careful. I did not do. I did the simple one. By, um, by virtue of choosing this quadratic form, no matter what s is, when x is 0, j is 0. That's what I meant by that comment. Correct. We're going to do that next, though, I promise. I have to sample over. Some finite, if I, if I picked a sufficiently rich set of U's, then it would do the best. But the problem is the optimal U is not in that finite sample for all X's. Great. One person is convinced. Yep. 
I chose Q and R, and for a different choice of Q and R, I would get a different optimal S and a different value function. But, but I changed, when I changed Q and R, I set it both in the loss for the value duration update and in my LQR solution. Guess what? It's going to be 10, 1, 1. I bet. I, 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 didn't, I don't even know. But I, I, unless I was so lazy that I chose 1, 1. But I, I just can't help myself. Oh, look at that. See, I just I. 1, 1. Okay. But if it was a physical system, I would have done 10, 1, because I, I can't help myself. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the thinking. I think there is an interpretation of sort of, especially if you start everything with zero, that the cost kind of leaks from the goal out. That's not quite what's happening in the algorithm. You actually have an estimate everywhere. I start with a small random numbers everywhere. So it's a little bit more complicated than what you say. But I think that intuition is roughly correct, right? So if you can't, what, what definitely happens is that when there is zero at the goal, then it will kind of be a vacuum that keeps everything, you know, Bounded at zero and, and to the true cost. Okay, I want to make a, an important point here on the LQR thing. So, so it turns out, so you know, we said that for, um, we know we have LQR is just kind of a function we can call, right? I, I put in A, B, Q, and R, and I get out K and F, right? Remember that? I hope that's. Clear enough since we've talked about it enough, okay? Um, what is the discounted LQR? Right, I want to put in A, B, Q, R, and gamma, and I want to get out K and S. It turns out it's exactly like calling LQR with Square root of gamma, A, B, Q, 1 over gamma, R. Make sure I get that right, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Yeah. It's like a, almost an algebraic observation. But its consequences are important. Like, really, I want you to get this point. Putting a gamma in my cost function is like pretending my A matrix is, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that, I'll make this more precise, but it's like pretending my A matrix is more stable than it actually is. It's like, it's, it, you can think of it as I am have a decaying cost to go. I'm going to just truncate things. That I don't care about too much in the future. There's an interpretation, an exact interpretation which is like if I was controlling a different system that was more stable than the one I'm actually controlling, it would get me the same cost. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this is a discrete time. We're talking about discrete time systems, right? This is xn plus 1 equals axn plus b un. So the stability, the passive stability of this system is based on the eigenvalues of a. In in discrete time, it's the what you want is that the you want the a, eigenvalues of a to be close to zero. Yeah. And if gamma is less than one, then this is making the eigenvalues smaller, closer to. So it's like so the, so okay, maybe I didn't so. So it's like pretend. So gamma was your choice. You didn't actually change the system. You made a modeling choice. It would be a, as if you didn't make that modeling choice, but you were working on a system that was more, this system is more stable than this. You agree? This is a number smaller than one. This is gonna take the eigenvalues of A and make them closer to the origin. So this system is more stable than this stable system. So my being, you know, loosey-goosey about the future is alike saying I'm working on a system that is more stable than it actually is. 
So that's fine. That's a, like a, that's a good thing to do. It makes things numerically converge. But even when you're in a more complicated RL settings, you should, I think, keep that in mind because putting a, a discount factor is like working on a slightly different system. In particular, the thing I was so happy about was that for any stabilizable A and B, you put any Q and R in, you'll always get a stabilizing system out. You could trick yourself with this. You could have a system that is, you could get a closed loop response that would be stabilizing for that system, but when you would apply it to this system, it actually causes the things to go unstable. So do discounting carefully, thoughtfully. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> In fact, yeah, they can just buy it. They can make it so you go unstable. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, you're going to penalize R more. This one's less important to me, I guess. It, it changes the magnitude of your use, but you're right. It, it, has, it also has an interpretation. Um, yeah, but I guess this number is going to be greater than one, so it's going to be like you're you're more afraid of action. This is a little weird. I would have thought the other way, maybe. I would think you'd be more willing to take action in the short term because you didn't care about. Yeah, it's fine. I guess it, I guess this, this is right, but uh, it's a little thought exercise there. Okay. Okay. Did I make that point? So so discounting works, but it does give you different controllers. K and S are going to be because it's going to be the K and S as if you had had this system instead. So the K and S is different. In that, yeah. Okay, the other way to fix it. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, the stability of, of a discrete time system goes by the eigenvalues of A being less than, yeah, going close to the origin. I'm just saying that if you multiply a matrix A by a scalar, that is less than one, you're going to dra drive the absolute value of the eigenvalues closer to zero. That's all I say. It's like things decay faster. In general, you'd have to compare the eigenvalues. A scalar multiple is like a case that's particularly simple effect on the eigenvalues. Yep. I would say if the if every eigenvalue got smaller, then I would call that safely call that more stable. Now, otherwise, you could talk about yeah, you you could put some sort of partial ordering on the on the thing based on the eigenvalues. But I think any ordering that had all of the eigenvalues be less, I would call more be safe calling more stable. Okay, next, so there's a way to do, to, to solve the numerical problem without discounting and changing the solution, right? And that is in a way choosing U samples better, but let me say it differently. Um, there's times where you can just not even sample over U and instead insert the true optimal U. Okay, so what, um, oh, I skipped my, skipped a page. Okay, here's a different solution. Use optimal use. Use optimal use, all right. Uh, right, in, just recall here, just to, since I did the CT version, not uh, continuous time, continuous time LQR, right? I had U star was a negative KX, which was negative R inverse 
um, B transpose S star X. We, we work a lot with that equation. The discrete time, right, discrete time LQR solution, I told you that it goes through. The math is almost the same. Um, it still has a controller of the form negative k star of x. It just happens that the form is a little bit more ugly. Bless you. Oops. Looks like b transpose s star b, that whole thing inverse b transpose s star a x, whatever. It's more to type in, but it's still something you can just solve, okay? Well, mostly, I wouldn't even write that down. This is what, I just want you to say it's still a linear function of, of x and one that we can solve away with the Riccati equation. Okay, so instead of sampling actions, let's do this. Let's just sample xi. Okay, and then I'll say JD, my desired J of I, is just, I'm going to just insert the optimal U for every X. Is that fair? Instead of doing the min over all of the J's, I'll just, I've solved it perfectly, so I'll stick the optimal U in there. The opt it's like sticking the optimal J in there. So basically, am I, I get like an x transpose i u x plus I'll call u hat i be my current estimate x i. Okay, u hat i are, does that make sense? j hat, depending on my S K X I plus B U hat I. Does that make sense? Instead of sampling U, for every X I can take my current S and just compute what the optimal, given that S, what would the optimal action be? And now, this thing that we talked through about having not enough use to, to sort of stabilize the system is no longer a problem. This, also, this is just another, without, another way to solve the problem. I find it more elegant because you don't have to change the cost function to do it. But just to prove it, this is that version. It also converges nicely to the right solution. Okay with gamma equals one. So I, I really think the problem was that the use, my nine sample use, didn't contain the optimal action for all the time. Yeah? Fair. Um, in this case, given S, and given the cost function, we're able to solve the optimal U, right? So it's a fair question, so how far does that go? It goes a lot farther than LQR, but it doesn't solve every problem, okay? So there's an important class, and that's actually why I wanted to, to mention it here. There's a super important class of systems that, um, for which that works. When does that work? Right, so the, the, the question was, you know, I, I basically what I said, given my current estimate, I'll call it in the more general case, given my estimate of this, given my cost function, and my dynamics, 
when can I solve for u hat at a sum sample as a function of these things? And it worked for LQR. And I'm going to try to convince you that it works actually for a lot of relevant systems. In particular, if you're control affine, then you, then you have a pretty good chance at doing this. I have to tell you that in two steps, okay? So what's, let's just think about where, sorry, did someone have a question in the middle? Or? Okay. So basically, I had this update, which was like a min over u, LXI u plus j desire, or j hat, alpha f s, uh, now xi u. All right, so when can I solve this min over u in closed form? That's the question. So the loss function, this one we get to pick. Okay, so. You know, I, I've been doing this a long time, and I've been mostly happy with restricting myself a, myself a little bit. If I were to say, go ahead and just restrict yourself to like, it can be an arbitrary cost on x, but I'll keep it as a quadratic penalty on u. It's very rare that I've felt constrained by that, okay? And that's just going to make my life easier. That, that one I get to pick, so just pick something easy for yourself in u, yeah? This one's a mess, right? U comes in, it goes through the dynamics, okay, and then it goes through J hat. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to solve for this, you know, I'm trying to keep it simple. I put it through my nonlinear dynamics, okay, and then if that wasn't bad enough, I stuck it through a neural network, okay? So that's like no chance. All right, things are a little bit better in continuous time. Actually, a lot better in continuous time. Remember that the continuous time HJB looked like this, right? In the infinitesimal case, I at least don't have to go through my neural network. I need the gradient of the neural network times my dynamics, okay? So the continuous time value duration is cleaner in this sense. And the same way I said I'm going to restrict myself to this, life is good in the particular case of this being control affine, where I had, I wrote that before as this. Remember, I told you that most of our robots, if torque is an input, it's control affine. Okay, so um, if my continuous time Bellman equation looks like this, and I want to take a min over u, then I've got a quadratic, positive quadratic form here, and u only enters linearly. It gets multiplied by something that's big and complicated and scary and as a function of x but it's just a linear in U. So this always has a closed form solution, which is um, our inverse F2X transpose partial J hat partial X transpose. This is evaluated at. Okay, so that's one of the reasons I say that things are more beautiful in continuous time. Okay, like it's really the difference between my U's go through the neural network or they get multiplied simply times the neural network. 
It's a big deal for me, okay? So you can do a completely continuous form of, of, uh, of all the value iteration codes and leverage this and get this benefit of, for many of our systems, closed form U. You don't even have to sample over U. You can just do that update. I was messing with that just before class, and I stubbornly decided to parallelize everything, and I introduced a bug. I can do, I could, I could show you, my value function looks good, but my pendulum falls down. Is that okay? It's still, I know it's very close, <laughs> but it's parallelized, so it's fairly fast. Um, what's that? It fails fast, not that fast, actually. So. But um, let's see if I got the right. Yeah. Okay, let me tell you a couple of the implementation details. So um, my goal, maybe by the weekend here, it will be to have um, two versions of this notebook, one using PyTorch. So I tend to, I would recommend PyTorch almost always. Um, but I actually also have uh, a small MLP, so multi-layer perceptron implementation inside Drake because in faster applications, the cost of going to Torch and back is actually just not worth it. And a lot of the neural networks we're using here are small. So I'm gonna have two, I'll have both versions. But, you know, the, the MLP one is the one I've got on the screen here, but the Drake uh, multi-layer perceptron version is here, but the PyTorch version's uh, probably more useful for many, more familiar to most of you. Um, <clears throat> but still, the, the architectures that people use here are, Pretty simple, so um, it's funny. We talk about you know deep reinforcement learning, right? But most of the time, the value function estimates are actually very small. So this, this is a um, it has two inputs, 64 hidden units, 64 hidden units, and one output for the value estimate. And the layers are ReLU, ReLU, identity. Okay, and that's a pretty standard. I mean, for a slightly bigger thing, you'd see 255, or you know, uh, here, right? But uh, 256 here, there, but um, they're pretty small. They tend to be this, this sort of three-layer uh, recipe is copied everywhere in in a lot of in the state-based control for these this class of systems. It goes a pretty long way. Um, okay, so in this particular notebook, I just was looking at first at the linear systems um, as a sort of sanity check. I just wanted to make sure that for the systems I have the known solution, like the minimum time solution, the optimal value function is actually non-trivial. So I was just like, let's do a supervised learning sanity check to make sure that my choice of MLP can represent that pretty non, you know, not very nice function, and it can. Okay, so that's good. It certainly, the quadratic function is not, a, not in question, but it captures that too. And then I have the discrete state, everything version of this with discounting. So I'll do, maybe I'll do the LQR one first, okay, and that just converges, but now this is actually using a neural network to represent the function approximator, okay? And then to scale to the slightly bigger systems, I have this continuous state action version, which is now parallel, but a little broken. <laughs> I know, I'll fix it very soon, okay? Um, but let's see, the double integrator is not very interesting, but I'll, let me run the pendulum. I parallelized the dynamics evaluation. The, and the neural network evaluation is also parallelized, but, um, or is batch. This is actually fairly fast compared to most high torch workflows, right? It's a small problem. Okay, so maybe I'll say while it's doing that, um, a couple other things. So um, you want your input features to wrap around in 2Pi. So typically people don't put theta directly into the network. They'll put in sine theta and cosine theta into the network. Okay. There's a handful of different tricks like this. They're all captured. Actually, sorry. There's a ton of tricks. Um, most of them PyTorch just does for you, right? Uh, when people did this in like 2005, things didn't really work that well, 
Okay, and what's changed between 2005 and now? Like a million little things. Random weight initialization got better and made a big difference. Atom got better. You know, like there's, there's a bunch of little things that happen. Of course, GPUs got better. Um, but, but in some ways, that's partly, I, I partly uh, re-implemented everything in Scratch just because I wanted to make sure I understood all those details. Yeah? But um, okay, so I get a beautiful cost to go out of my, for my pendulum, my parallelized pendulum. And, oh, oh, it's fixed. <laughs> I wanted to do the same thing every time I run it. I don't know why that happened. Okay, I'll look at that more carefully. Um, there's a deprecation warning which can't be helping me, but uh, I haven't quite finished the Acrobat, but that'll be done like by the, by the weekend. Okay, this this one does go the distance. Well, let's talk about that for a second. So um, you don't have to sample on a regular mesh, and we can rely on some of the biases in neural networks. I think to maybe do a, some do something a little bit better than what a Barycentric mesh does. Okay, so there's kind of just a hope there and a, and a, a practical experience there that it could potentially do better. Um, the Acrobat, I can still pick samples, you know, fairly densely over the state space, but they don't have to be uniform. And I think this gets you through problems of size Acrobats and, and other small things. At some point, like I said, you can't sample try to sample densely over the entire state space as the state dimension grows. You need to do something to, to shape your samples in the relevant part of state space. The way RL typically does that is they will do long simulation rollouts. Okay, and then you, you take your policy, you roll it out for 10 seconds, you evaluate yourself, you update everything along that particular rollout. There's an alternative that's sort of in between here, which is you take your, a bunch of random samples and you evolve all of them in parallel, a handful of steps. That can, also shape the distribution, and that will be more effective in the states, in the systems where you can carry that number of samples across. But when you, you know, when you go to really big systems, you just try to do single sim simulation rollouts. The best. We're also in here, we're leveraging the model more than what people would normally do in, um, in RL, right? So for instance, this, this one very explicitly, if I'm gonna take the, and solve U, this means I know F2, I knew that it was control affine, right? I'm taking gradients of J. That's exploiting the model in a big way. Um, even if I were to do the min over this, in some ways I'm exploiting the model in a big way here because I, I said in a, when I was in a particular state, I'm allowed to run a one-step simulation for all of my U samples, evaluate each of them and take the best. You can only do that if you have a simulator in your head. Right, so the, the, the more pure RL approach would not assume that you have access to that to do the simulation in your head. But when you do, when you have a simulator, you can exploit it and maybe should exploit it. We'll talk more, more, more about RL in, in a little while. Yeah. So like this is, this is called neural fitted value iteration. Let's say people have various uh, names for it, but that's a that's one of them. Yeah. Yes. So that's a, that's the that's another. So uh, even the fact that I'm only learning a value or solving for a value function is also different from the typical thing in in reinforcement learning. Typically, you would learn a Q function so that you can sample from that to, in order to, to execute. Right. I'm I'm saying that even at the on policy, I either need to solve for this or I need to do uh, my little simulations in my head in order to take the optimal action. That's true, the policy evaluations require it. Yes? Yes, so far perfect, models are perfect. Yeah, we can, well, things are gonna be pretty robust to that in some ways, but we'll study that carefully later in the term. Good, okay, I'm glad it worked. I don't know why. I shouldn't have said it didn't work. You wouldn't.